Hello and welcome to Winging It. So this is part two of my series in which I'm taking a look at the maths behind Wingspan. So if you haven't seen part one already, I recommend checking that out. We took a look at the different hunting powers in the base game of Wingspan. But in this part two, we will be taking a look at the bird feeder. So this is another element of Wingspan where there's a lot of randomness and chance and being able to understand the probabilities that drive this uh, is so key to being able to make the right decisions at the right time and be able to improve your gameplay and your scoring potential. So anyone who's played the game will know that there are five dice in the bird feeder and there are five different food types as well. So on each dice there's a single face for each food type and then the final face is a worm stroke seed where you get to choose which one of those you want when taking that from the bird feeder. So you probably have some kind of intuition and probably this will be based on experience playing the game as well that tells you that you're going to expect to get more worms and seeds compared to getting the cherries, fish or the rodents. But what does this actually mean in the game? You know, what does this mean in practice when you're re-rolling the dice, resetting the bird feeder? You know, a good question to ask is, okay, how likely am I to get two worms? Or how likely am I to get two fish? You know, I'm twice as likely to get a single worm, but am I twice as likely to get two worms against two fish? Is it more than twice as likely? Is it less than twice as likely? You know, I don't feel like there's an easy way to have good intuitive sense of these kind of probabilities. So what we're going to do in this video, we're going to take a look behind the scenes, do some number crunching and hopefully give ourselves some useful tools for when we're playing wingspan and when we're trying to make key decisions to try and score as many points as possible. But before we do that, I want to go through some example scenarios in the game. So in each of these scenarios, I want you to think about you know, what's your intuition here? What's your gut feeling for what you would do in each of these scenarios? And then once we've taken a look at the numbers and the probabilities behind these, we can then come back to these scenarios and using this new information we've got, we can really properly tackle these and maybe compare the answers to, you know, what your gut feeling was and see whether you were right or whether you were wrong here. So, in this scenario one, we have the Northern Flicker, which is a when played power that lets you gain all the worms in the bird feeder. And we have a single worm in the bird feeder. And the question here is, do you take that worm or do you re-roll it and hope for more? So as you'll know, if you play the game, any time all the dice in the bird feeder show the same face, you're allowed to re-roll. Uh, and this also applies in this case where there's only a single dice so, yep, the question here is, do you take the worm or do you re-roll and hope you can get more? Scenario two is kind of a similar one. So this time we're playing the bold eagle. Again, this is a similar when played power, except this time you're gaining all the fish in the bird feeder. And in this scenario, we have a single fish. And again, the question is, do you take that fish or do you re-roll and hope you can get more? And finally, we have scenario three where this time we have two birds that we're comparing. So we've got the yellow-bellied sapsucker and the great crested flycatcher. So these are two very similar birds. You see they both go in the forest. They both got the same food cost, same nest, same egg spaces, um, and a very similar brown power. So the key difference here is the sapsucker gains from the supply, whereas the flycatcher is going to gain from the bird feeder if there is one. So in the sapsucker's case, you're always getting that worm from the supply. It's going to be a guaranteed worm, but the flycatcher is all going to depend on if you can get a worm from the bird feeder, um, and maybe if you have to re-roll, whether you can get a worm on that re-roll. Uh, so the question here is, you know, which of these is better? So is it worth gaining that two extra points from the flycatcher, but sacrificing that guarantee of a worm when activating? So hopefully you've had a think about those scenarios, and we'll be able to take a look at the numbers now. So, as discussed before, we've got five different food types here. We've got worms, seeds, cherries, fish, and rodents. And for each of these, I'm going to take a look at the probability of rolling 
between 0 and 5. So, you know, we've got 5 dice. In theory, we could roll 0 of each of these, but also we could roll all the same and get 5 of each of these on the reroll. So, we'll start by taking a look at the worms and the seeds. Functionally, these work the same. You know, they've both got that single face that shows that food type and then the additional face where you can choose either of these foods to take and yep you'll see from the breakdown you know, only 13 percent of the time you're not going to get any um, most of the time you're going to get either one or two 33 percent of the time in each case and then it sort of tapers off as you get more and more so you know you've probably had a game if you've played enough where you get five worms or five seeds uh, it is going to happen but you know, less than one percent of the time so uh, pretty unlikely and yeah probably not something you can reliably expect when re-rolling the bird feeder. Next we can take a look at the remaining food types so again the cherries, the fish and the rodents they work the same because they all have that single face with that food type on. So what's kind of gonna stick out to you here and probably shouldn't be too surprising um, if you've got experience playing the game is how these numbers are shifted towards the lower end so you know, you're much more likely to get either zero or one of these foods than you are to get more than that. So 40% of the time you're not going to get any. Uh, again, probably not hugely surprising if you've played the game enough. You'll know plenty of times you reroll the bird feeder and don't get any of these. Uh, but you know, reasonably often, 40% of the time you'll get one and then very quickly tapers off. So you know, you're very unlikely to, to roll even more than one, but certainly rolling rolling more than two of any of these types is uh, is very unlikely. Now this table is useful and it forms a good baseline for our analysis but it's quite intense. There's a lot of numbers here, it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to remember and certainly you know if I'm in a game, if I'm trying to think about my chances of getting certain food type, I'm not going to be able to remember all of this information. I think really there's kind of three things that I'm going to look to have in my mind when I'm going for a reroll. How likely am I to get at least one of a food type? How likely am I to get more than one? And on average, how many should I expect to get on a reroll? I think those are the three kind of key things that I'd look to remember. So we can take a look at another table, which is essentially going to take that first table and just condense it down into those kind of three key points that I was talking about. So again, we will start with the worms and the seeds and just taking that first row from our previous table, we know 30% of the time you're not going to get any, but that means that the other 87% of the time you're going to get at least one. And again, you know, using some of that data from our table, we can work out how likely you are to get more than one. And in the case of worm and seeds, it's 54% of the time. So again, quite reassuring. Yeah, it's more than 50%. More often than not, you're going to get at least two on a re-roll in the bird feeder. And lastly, we can take a look at the expected value. So this is essentially just a weighted average of the probabilities in the first table, where each probability is weighted according to how many of each food you'd get in the bird feeder in each case. And we can see that on average, you will expect 1.67 of each of these food types. So again, not too surprising, kind of matches with the rest of the data in this table, but also sort of fits your intuition just from playing the game as well, in that you're going to expect more than one, you know, quite a lot of the time you get two even. So certainly, you know, somewhere between one and two, leaning more towards two. Um, that sort of, for me at least, I think that fits my intuition there. And next we can again take a look at the other food types. So we've got the cherries, the fish and the rodents. So as before, we'll take this first row from our previous table. We know that 40% of the time we're not going to get any of these food types. But that means that the other 60% of the time we're going to get at least one. So even that again is quite reassuring. You know, more often than not, you're going to get at least one. Um, where it really starts to taper off very quickly is when you look at getting more than one. So only 20% of the time are you going to get more than one of these. So, you know, if you're looking for two cherries or three fish, three rodents to play some of those really big point birds at the end of the game, 
it's quite unlikely that you're going to be able to get that food. And yeah, like I said, I think being able to understand and appreciate these numbers is going to help make that decision a lot easier at the end of the game. And lastly, we can take a look at the expected value. Again, probably not hugely surprising. You know, we can already see just from the numbers here, a lot of the time you're not going to get any. And most of the time when you do see these foods in the bird feeder, you're only going to get one. So it kind of makes sense that the expected value is about one, but slightly lower. Um, and just comparing across the food types, you know, I think it makes sense that you're going to get on average twice as many worms or seeds compared to the other food types because there's twice as many faces on the dice that show those so um, again i feel like the numbers here probably back up what your intuition is telling you so now that we've done that analysis and we've got that information we can use these tools to revisit those scenarios from earlier and take a look at kind of what the numbers tell us are the right decisions in each case so going back to that first scenario just to remind you we're playing the northern flicker and we have a single worm in the bird feeder and the question is do we take that worm or do we re-roll and hope for more so we know from that last table on average we're going to expect 1.67 worms on a re-roll and that is more than the one that we've got here so what the numbers tell us here to do is to re-roll because on average we're going to get more worms on the re-roll than we have here and kind of even just ignoring that expected value i think just looking at some of those probabilities from before this kind of makes sense you know 87 percent of the time we're going to get at least one so we're not going to end up in a worse position but actually 54 percent of the time we're going to get at least two and that's going to put us in a better position and certainly more often than not you're going to end up with more worms here and so on average if you're looking to maximize the number of food that you're getting from this flicker, you should be re-rolling here. Now scenario two, again, very similar, just to remind you, we're playing the bold eagle and we have a single fish in the feeder. And the question again is, do we take that fish or do we re-roll and hope for more? Now this time we know from the table that the expected number of fish on a re-roll is only 0.83. So in this case, it's less than the one that we have here. And so what that tells us is that in order to maximize our number of fish, we should be taking that fish and not re-rolling. So again, I think this probably fits what you would have taken from the probabilities that we saw. You know, 40% of the time, we're gonna re-roll and not see any fish. And only 20% of the time, are we gonna see more than one. So more often than not on a re-roll, you're gonna put yourself in a worse position. So if you're looking to maximize the number of fish on average, you're gonna not re-roll, you're gonna take the fish. Now, obviously, this is entirely situational. You know, if this is late in the game and you need two or three fish to play a big point bird, say you're looking to play the Atlantic Puffin at the end of the game, and that one fish is not going to help you, then you go for the reroll. You're going to gamble. You know, this is entirely situational. All these numbers tell us is what the right move is on average. You know, over hundreds, thousands of games that you're playing, what's the right move to do? Um, but certainly, there will be situations where re-rolling would be better. And finally, scenario three, to remind you, we have these two birds, the sapsucker and the flycatcher, with these very similar powers. And the question was, is it worth getting those two extra points on the flycatcher, but lose the guarantee of a worm? Now, this is a bit more of a difficult one to answer. I think the best approach really is to kind of look at those probabilities again of, you know, how often am I going to be able to activate this flycatcher on a reroll? We know that 87% of the time you're going to get at least one worm and be able to activate that. So only 13% of the time is it going to fail. And I like to think of that as about one in eight. So if you're doing eight activations of these birds, we know the sap sucker, it's going to work every time. We're going to get eight worms. From the flycatcher, we'd probably expect one failure. So we're only going to get seven out of eight. And I think eight is probably a good number to look at here. You know, it's unlikely you're going to be activating either of these birds more than eight times, just considering the limited number of turns in a game of wingspan. Um, so really what you're kind of looking at here is, okay, if I play this on the first turn, I'm going to be gaining two points but losing a worm. So is that worm worth two points to you? Maybe. I think this is a really difficult one to answer. 
Um, for me personally, if I have the choice between the two of these at the start of the game, I'm going to be playing that sap sucker every time. You know, I want that guaranteed worm. I want to be able to make sure I can get that early in the game, so I can play more birds, can start to build up that engine and score more points. And really, I'd expect to make up that two point difference over the course of the game. But you know, if this is in the mid to late game, you know, maybe we're in round three. I'm playing one of these birds. I'll probably lean towards the flight catcher. You know, at that point, I prioritise those points. I know I'm not going to activate these birds that often throughout the remainder of the game so I'll take my chances on those re-rolls and yeah certainly for me playing a five point bird in that round three or later feels a lot stronger than, than playing a three point bird. So that's all the scenarios looked at again and just before we end the video uh, I'll bring up that final table once again just because I think this is probably the key takeaway really. You know, this has got some useful numbers in it to just have in the back of your mind so you know, try and remember how likely you are to get at least one of each of these foods more than one and then that average number as well you know i think this is a really useful thing to have in your mind all throughout the game you know this is so useful early in the game when it's really hard to get food you know you might only be getting one or two food a turn being able to get the right food so you can get birds down quickly is so crucial early in the game so being able to understand your chances so that you know whether it's worth going for a re-roll maybe doing something else first that's going to be so crucial but equally late in the game this is so important you know maybe you've only got two or three turns left and your key decision is do i go for food and try and play some big point birds or do i lay eggs instead or score points otherwise and you know being able to understand you know maybe i'm looking for two fish I've only got a 20% chance of getting that. You know, that's really going to help guide my decision on whether it's worth going for food or whether I should do something else. So hopefully you found that useful and interesting. Like I said, this is part two of a series of videos in which I'm taking a look at various different mathematical aspects of Wingspan. So if you'd like to stay up to date with this series, get notified when future parts come out, then please consider subscribing to my channel. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.